Oh, well. All right, now that my door is shut, let's do five seconds of silence starting now. Nah. That's over five. How about that? Job's done. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Sean Walton. I'm Nate Burgess. And I'm Phil DeLuca. And we are Commanderin. <laughs> <laughs> Music, here's the music. Well, Shivam, since you started off the show, you want to you want to just do the uh, the show intro. <laughs> oh man, can I? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Thanks for listening. We're gonna put a spotlight on community issues, but never ever talk about four bad topics: islands, mountains, swamps, and plains. Wait a minute. <laughs> oh, oh, we're, we're, we're going to talk about swamps. <laughs> Oh, gosh. Yeah, I'm are. sorry, guys. Let me check the other one. I actually meant we're never going to talk about four banned topics. Hearthstone, 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 and stuff. <laughs> 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 I'll have you know, Shivam, that some of our listeners take that as a sacred promise. <laughs> I'm actually playing Hearthstone right now. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys, I'm totally blowing this audition to be the new Sean Vum. <laughs> oh. Sean Vum. <laughs> <laughs> well, if if whoever stuck around likes what they hear <laughs> and want to support the show, go to patreon.com slash commander and MTG and donate to us. Patreon allows you to give back to the creators you appreciate. If you donate a buck a show with our new buck a show feature, did you know that? We got one. A whole uh, pledge tier level now, buck a show. Mm. It helps immensely. And if you donate $10 per show, you get full frontal access to all of the hosts in our exclusive Facebook chat group. Now, if that doesn't get you to donate, nothing will. Patroni there also get to contribute to show plans, and they get sneak peeks and sometimes even exclusive content. Nate, I feel exclusive content coming on. Do you now? I do. We should probably talk about that in the next few days or so. Mm. <gasps> Surprise! And uh, that Facebook chat group is actually really cool and has a lot of really helpful people in there. But be warned, they do talk a lot all the time forever. But it's really cool, though. <laughs> yes. It's super neat to be a part of that community. It actually is all the time and forever. I'm really glad you guys invited me to join it. It's super neat. I recommend other people join the Patroni community as well. Well, thank you. Cool. <laughs> um, also, check us out on YouTube. Nate has put many videos up there uh, to sync with our episodes. And now Hunter Pruitt and Bradford Heron, who you've heard here referred to as, uh, what is it, uh, Fordsworth, right? Mm -hmm. Both of them are super patrons, and uh, they're working to bring you videos every single week. Yeah, Bradford was one of our co-hosts during an encyclopedia. Oh, yeah, that's right. In episode 60. <laughs> this week, we have a wonderful show lined up for our listeners, don't we, guys? <laughs> We're going to talk about Brea with a deck inspired by Kaladesh. And to do that, we brought an expert on all things Kaladeshi. None other than the royal recipient of a royal Thopter Pie Network Two royals. I snuck that second one in there. <laughs> <laughs> gave him the royal, did you? <laughs> Into the royal. Hey, what? Guys. We gave him the royal treatment. <laughs> Mr. Shivam Butt. Hello, my friends. It's been quite, uh, quite a couple of months since the last time I was on here. Uh, it seems like a set or two came out, and I guess my life got upended. <laughs> yeah, the whole world changed. A smidge. And also, uh, going back and re-listening to that old episode I was in, I was so excited for Kaladesh. 
I was so <laughs> excited. And then it was like a renegade freighter running right into an 07 wall. Aww. Just like, wham. Might want to pick a different metaphor there. Oh, does I have trample? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It, it's, it still was uh, quite the system shock. <laughs> the wall. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I guess for the people who didn't hear me last time, um, I'm a cultural commentator and former video games journalist and uh, video games industry guy and gamer in general. Um, I tend to talk a lot about Hinduism and culture and uh, pop culture and Kaladesh just happened to be the block that um, my interests all collided and the last time I was here we got to talk a lot about diversity in Magic and in Commander and what I was hoping to see out of Kaladesh and the nature of being represented in Magic sets, arts and gaming and I laid out what I thought my hopes for what the set would be and mm -hmm. then I think the week after that PAX happened and I was invited to go to PAX by Wizards of the Coast, a guest of Helene Bergeau and um, I got to see their Kaladesh layout and their presentations and all of the majesty and wonder that they put on in Seattle and had one of the worst breakdowns of my life because it was terrible bad it was mm. maybe one of the more miserable like weekends I've ever had. Oh, no. Because, oh, dude, I was sitting on the sixth floor of PAX just like bawling to myself because of how just crushing it was to see this set go completely wrong from everything I'd hoped. Like, to rehash a smidge of what I wrote initially when this set came out, it was like going to, I guess the metaphor is like, you wait a very long time for representation and you wait a really long time. You're patient. You applaud everybody else. You're so happy for them. And then your turn comes up and they come to you and say, okay, it's finally your turn. You've been waiting for years. We're going to take your culture and show it off to everybody. So just bring your costumes and clothes and stuff and put them in the hall. And then we can go and set up a diorama and it'll be great. And then you go there and they're like, oh, we just needed the stuff. You, you can go home. We'll see you in a bit. And you're like, well, what do you mean I can go home? I'm here. This is my stuff. I've got a whole plan to show off my culture. And they're like, no, we just needed the decorations. And then they, you go home and you come back and you see that they've built this whole huge diorama. And it's got nothing to do with anything of your culture at all, except the colors and textiles are similar. And some of the proper names have been used. But otherwise, it's just, I don't know, American Graffiti, the uh, set, or... You know, I use Grease Lightning. Grease Lightning. I use Grease, Grease rather. Yeah, Grease is good. Just like, yeah. you know, roadsters and drag dragsters and this whole 1950s Americana yeah. just kind of decked out like pseudo-India. Yeah. And it was just like like turbines that are shaped like onion domes and yeah. all of this just complete. I mean, it was all of this just all at once just kind of came crashing in. And I was like, what in the f Heck, just happened. <laughs> and the worst part was like, so I, I went and I talked to them and I'm like, guys, you used my culture but didn't use any of the culture at all remotely? And they're like, well, we didn't want to offend anybody. I'm like, not offending somebody means, you know, don't like make a, you know, a statue out of pork and beef or something. Not don't use anything. Because when you go so far into safe, you end up tokenizing and like turning people into um, caricatures, you know? And it was like, okay, well, there's a couple of names here. But the, when Kaladesh came out, there were two monkeys in the set and they were cat monkeys because they couldn't be real monkeys. But they were called Vandars, which means monkey in Hindi, which is great, fine. But we have a race of beings in India that destroy everything in your house and those are monkeys not gremlins which are definitely not from any indian culture actually nothing about this set was from an indian culture dwarves are not in indian cultures you know elves aren't uh, certainly aetherborn aren't but the stories as they came out started developing the dalkin they're from india oh yeah you know the vidalkin of course the the four-armed yeah. blue-skinned gentleman 
Let me talk yeah. to you about those. Long story short, I was very disappointed with that initial impression. Like, super disappointed. But, um, I mean, I gave it a chance because my friend Sean is the guy who designed the set, and I trust him a lot, and his sets have always been among my favorites. And over time, as it turned out, Kaladesh is pretty much my favorite set of all time. Except for the flavor, the set is everything I want out of Magic. It's amazing. It's so much fun to play, which is why you see things like Angel of Invention, which is, you know, a four-armed mm. deity with red skin of Durga, the, the helmet of Balaji, and the this and that, and all of the just Hindu tropes wrapped into an angel. An angel, not even an Indian flying beast, like as if we don't have any of them in Hinduism. But it's like, okay, you're going to take the Judeo-Christian angel? Really? Really? <sighs> well, those were the props they had laying around. Right. I mean, the thing is, they had cultural commentators come on and help. They had six people from inside of Wizards who were of, like, you know, South Asian descent. Generally, for the most part, they were South Indian people. And um, that doesn't really impact anything. But they were shown a handful of cards and asked to, you know vet and say hey is this offensive is this okay and that's how you avoided things like oh okay you know what don't use saffron clothing don't use uh green domes because that's a dome of muhammad all these other things but they didn't like ask for feedback of what would be cool they were just like okay well we're not we're going to use this whether you like it or not like i don't know if you saw the angel of inventions dressed in saffron the one color they said they weren't going to do and i'm like yeah. guys 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 you're killing Oh, they actually said they would not do a saffron color. Yeah, because they uh, said they wouldn't because saffron is the color of Hinduism. It's like the literal, like when you go to the, in in India, if you just have a saffron flag, that in itself denotes Hinduism. That's like, it's like the most evocative symbol, you know? And it's like, oh, guys, guys. (sighs) But the set is so good. I love the artifact themes. I love energy and the stories that came out, the fiction and creative in this set is some of my favorite that's ever been done in Magic. So I was super excited. And at the same time, it's just like you're stabbing me in the stomach every time. And um, I made a post about pronunciations and stuff that I thought y'all would find interesting. Yeah. Because... Did this come out with Ether Revolt? Uh, no, it came out with Cottage because it turns out Ether Revolt only had a few words that uh, people didn't know how to pronounce. Specifically, uh, Kari Zev and her monkey Raghavan, which, by the way, the best characters in the block, not going to lie. A sky pirate with a real Langur monkey. So cool. Absolutely. So cool. Yeah, so college. And they definitely could have used more monkeys in the set. Such a missed opportunity. Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. But, um, yeah, no, though, I, like... I mean, I love Kaladesh enough that I wanted to make a mono Nalar family deck. And then Brea came out and Brea is like the Thopter queen. And I'm like, okay, this is going to be, this is going to be the mega Kaladesh set. And it's going to be amazing. So I'm super excited to talk about that and to talk about the set in general, if you guys want. Yeah, it sounds good. We will get to that in uh, just a few short minutes, I think. I do agree that the, uh, the stories have generally been better for this particular block. Um, I haven't not read. We're kind of behind the scenes, listeners. We're recording this on Wednesday, and I have not read the story yet from today. Uh, but uh, hopefully, there's a certain named Thopter. Um, Nate is now naming all of his Thopters. Isn't that right, Nate? Uh, what few there are, sure. <laughs> there's Ornery Thopter, and eh, what? I'm <laughs> Thopting over here. Get off my sky. Yes, <laughs> that is exactly what I hoped would happen. <laughs> All right, so some news. Um, just a very quick reminder that Los Angeles area folks should visit Geeky Teas, the drink teas in Burbank. Um, and if you mention the Commander and Podcast, you will get a buck off your all-day seat at a gaming table. It's like 20% off. We say that only because she's letting us run a, a league there, and so say hi. Oh, that's super cool. Um, yeah, isn't it? Uh, EDHREC.com. What's next, Nate? Nate, the author of several articles at EDHREC.com. Hopefully by the time 
uh, this comes, this episode drops, there will be another article there. Mm -hmm. Uh, depending on their publishing schedule, you'll be looking at Ishai or Tana or Silas Wren. Hmm. When does, uh, Ikra Shadiki get her moment in the spotlight or it's moment in the, in the spotlight? Oh, you'll have to find out. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm super excited. I love those articles. I think you've been doing a great job. I'm really happy that Edrek is actually uh, turning into articles and stuff. That's super neat. Yeah, isn't it cool? Yeah, I've been definitely enjoying that. And uh, as astute listeners have noticed, except for a brief moment in the very beginning of the show, um, where uh, we heard from Sean Vum, <laughs> Sean Watson is uh, not with us today, Nate. Uh, how did he uh, did he recover yet from the uh, Queensbury gremlin hunt? Uh, the North Queensbury gremlin hunt, yeah, yeah. the gremlinery, <laughs> yeah, he recovered. The gremlinery, right? <laughs> and now he has started a lizard farm. Oh, yes. Oh, he's, he's taking lizards. he's taking rescue lizards that have been abandoned and raising them in humane environments. Uh, it's Britain, I believe they call it <laughs> lizard. Lizard with a U, like you know the. The, the famed comedian, Eddie Lizard. Yes. Um, what do you think he's going to do with those uh, Lizards once he raises them? Oh, he's training them. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we'll check in a little bit later and see how the training's going. Good luck with that training, Sean. We know you listen to uh, the show while <laughs> uh, <laughs> doing whatever it is you need to do to Lizards. Now that we've covered our news... We are going to go to our main topic. Now, Shivam, you, uh, we were actually just inviting you on, and you suggested that we talk about your brand new Brea deck. Yes, because uh, I was hoping to have this finished in time to be able to go to GP San Jose this weekend, where I'm planning on having, or I guess the weekend we're recording, because I'm planning on having an EDH corner in the back of the room where we can all sit and, you know, hit each other with sticks. Oh, we should mention that as news, actually. Uh, oh, but it doesn't yeah. matter. How was GP San Jose? Oh, <laughs> uh, it was Never definitely mind. Californian. Yeah, it was Californian. Um, how, did, how did Nate do? Awesome! After spending $80, <laughs> he got wiped out by Efro in the first round, and then we never saw him again. Uh-huh. I've been doing his voice the whole time. Wow. Does, uh, does Chris know Nate? Quit it. <laughs> It's my voice. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Sorry. Carry on about your Brea deck. I'm very eager to get to it. Well, um, basically, uh, when the new commander sets came out, you know, we saw all these four color commanders. But what it struck me was when you were talking in one of your interview podcasts, I think with uh, Ethan Fleischer about how we were expecting a red blue Thopter queen. And he gave us a red blue Thopter Queen. Just happened to tack on white and black while we're at it. <laughs> yeah. So I was like, hey, you know what? I was looking for a deck that would basically let me play Vir- Whirler Virtuoso anyways. So uh, I totally started taking apart Brea. And now I've got 450 cards that need to go into my 100 card deck. <laughs> hmm. That's too many. Yeah, but I mean, Antiquity to Ornithopter. How do you say no to that? No. No, it's a, <laughs> it's it's totally a mox if you're using like you know one of the new mechanics. It's very true. Yeah, ornithopter. We we will talk about that particular combo a little bit later. Yeah, I mean, I've basically been spending a lot of time just trying to build this deck and getting all my favorite Kaladesh cards ready to uh, mess with. Because as you said earlier, I was lucky enough to get a Thopter Pie Network. Yes, you were, dude. These cards are so cool. I mean, uh, it's a enchantment for two blue blue that says at the beginning of your upkeep if you're eating create a one one colorless thopter token uh, with flying and you use food to represent it and when a creature you control dies if it's represented by food you eat it and that is my favorite way to play (laughs) so we'll hear we'll have reports on twitter about you eating during your game bringing a giant sack of m&ms it's gonna be good times Mm mm-hmm well, if I kill your Thopter, do I get to eat it? No. It seems that's the way it should be. I mean, yeah, I guess so, right? Like, I mean, if you can sacrifice your own Thopters, then you can eat your own Thopters. But if so, what else... I was thinking though is like, if I had <laughs> Fling, I could start throwing M and M's at people. 
Oh, yeah. <laughs> just be like, take a damage, buddy. Ding! Mm. <laughs> <laughs> right off the dome. <laughs> well, then they get to ear thopters in that case. Uh, you know, it's, it's a fair trade at that point. <laughs> <laughs> Have a candy! <laughs> <laughs> I thought you guys said you weren't going to make me laugh. <laughs> it's a little violent candy sharing, isn't it? Oh, man. <laughs> it's the ornery thopter again. <laughs> You better watch out, kid. And man, I'm a little sick, so I'm a little coffee. <laughs> yeah, we're killing Shivam, Nate. Well, you are. Mm. Aw. Mm. So, <laughs> so did you start from another deck, or uh, did you just see Brea and just start? No, I I part? started literally from the precon, and I just took it, and I've been swapping out cards and putting them into like, basically like taking out the cards that don't matter to my theme, like. Godo Bandit Warlord, because he's not a Thopter. Or Whip Flare, a card that, like, seems totally stupid. Get out of here, Whip Flare. <laughs> he doesn't even have any wings. <laughs> Seriously. And I was looking at, like, the partner dudes, like Silas Ren and Bruce Tarl and whatever, but they're also not Kaladeshi or Thopters. And I thought, you know, one of those guys could be a Panharmonicon. That's much better. There's not nearly enough, I think, uh, talk done about taking these pre-con decks that we all get and just modifying from there. Like we hear a lot about people starting, you know, like I grabbed this commander and then I built a whole deck around him. But I feel like there's an underserved population of people who just go out and buy the pre-con and then just start slotting cards in and out. And that's kind of how I do it, right? Like I'm not good enough to be able to take a deck from scratch and build it. So Mm -hmm. I like to use the kind of, ideas that wizards gives us as a starter set and saying like oh if this is a mono rock then maybe i can replace it with a better one but at least i know that there should be one there so i find it a lot better to use these pre-cons as templates almost you're gonna want some more uh card draw that's for sure yeah and a cyclonic rift dude i can't find a cyclonic rift to save my life (laughs) i went to like four stores they're all sold out what are these stores you speak of? Oh, you want me to buy online? No, no, I'm <laughs> kidding. <laughs> also, I need no. to get like a beta or unlimited soul ring because I am not dealing with this new art. Not gonna happen. No, why? Because the old soul rings are orange. They're amazing. Why would you want a new soul ring? Well, so is the um, so is the invention. Well, yes, but like an unlimited soul ring is like fifteen dollars, and invention soul ring is like a hundred million dollars. And yeah, um, but I do have like four inventions in here already, four or six, maybe six or seven inventions in here already. So maybe I will just. There's a lot of scratching right now. Uh, sorry, I was shuffling my deck. I'm really bad about that. Um, oh, okay. <clears throat> I'm not gonna lie. When they started releasing inventions in the fancy lands in Cal- in Zendikar, uh, I basically had to have them all. I don't have them all yet, but I'm working on it. So like I've got you know I don't have to have them all. I just have to have the ones that are good in EDH. Pretty much. So I have like yeah. Mana Vault and uh Steel Overseer because that's amazing in an artifact deck. Mm-hmm. As, Nate showed me how uh amazing that can that can be. I put in uh the combustible gear hulk, the red one. Yeah. Because it's good card draw and it's good in politics. And it's also a really pretty picture. And uh I don't know. I can't seem to find my other ones, but I've got a grip of them that I'm putting in here because it's it's fun to have fun-looking cards. I mean, the whole point of EDH is like to play your favorite cards, right? And your favorite cards are shiny. This is true. Not going to lie. <laughs> if they ever ban Soul Ring, I am quitting. Don't ban Soul Ring. It's the best. <laughs> mm, don't go to France. God, dude. I have thoughts about those uh, Singleton Commander players, let me tell you. The what are the com- competitive commander? What do they call it? Competitive EDH. No, thank you. Or dual commander. Dual commander. That's a word I was looking for. But yeah, I also have like a you know chromatic lantern and uh, sculpting steel because I think that would be neat in here. Like I'm just super excited. I think Brea is super fun looking, and I'm looking forward to trying to go infinite multiple different ways. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about some of those ways. Cool. Well, what's the first combo you wanted to put in? So I guess I should read Brea for the audience because when you're driving in your car, you don't have him with you. Um, Brea, of course. What? Wait, wait, wait. What's this? 
People drive their cars and do not have their magic cards well, I at mean, hand. Presumably it's not taped to your like rear view mirror unless, you know, you're like me. But Yeah. No. <laughs> we wouldn't ever tape our magic cards over just read Brea. Right. <laughs> so Brea the Ethereum shaper is uh well, I guess white, red, blue, black. I don't know, we should just call him Greenless or something, I guess, right? But um legendary artifact creature human. And uh, when Brea enters the battlefield, you get two blue 1-1 one, one Thopters with flying, because they don't make non-flying Thopters. Um, and for two colorless, you can uh, sacrifice two artifacts and either uh, do three damage to a person, neg four, neg four to a creature, or gain five life. Mm -hmm. And because she's an artifact creature, uh, that means you could pitch her as well, right? So um, the first combo that like immediately came to mind when I was looking at this was how do you make her do stupid things infinitely? Because <laughs> one of my favorite cards as a kid was Ashnod's Altar. You know, the uh, two mana casting cost artifact that you could sacrifice an artifact to get two colorless. Um, or is it three mana casting cost, whatever. Three. But with this, if you pitch all three of her artifacts, Mm-hmm then you get six mana. Mm -hmm. And there's a card called uh, Nim Death Mantle, which is like the most obvious combo everybody's used because when a creature you control goes into the graveyard, you could pay four mana and bring it back from the graveyard, attach it to Nim Death Mantle, and it gets some bonuses that don't matter to anything because the point is her enter the battlefield <laughs> and it comes into play again, and you get two more blue 1-1 one -one Thopters. And because it only costs you four, that leaves you with a net of two. So eventually, uh -oh. you're just going to have infinite mana. And uh, infinite mana means that you can do things like cast Stream of Life and get infinite life. Boring. <laughs> no one casts Stream of Life. You could cast that one white X accent and plane spell that, does, that uh, prevents X damage from happening. Right? Like, that's awesome, too, right? <laughs> <laughs> what else you got? Uh, what would you do with that, Nate? Comet Storm! Yeah. <laughs> you, you, you could also just, you know, Comet Storm and kill the table, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. But the other trick is, because she's already going to the graveyard a million times, there are cards that care about things going to the graveyard, specifically artifacts. And one of the coolest cards that was in Kaladesh was the Marionette Master, um, which mm -hmm. is the uh, four and two black human artificer with Fabricate 3. Fabricate, by the way, best mechanic ever, not going to lie. And because when you put the three one ones on it, it becomes a four or seven uh, or four six. But when an artifact you control is put in the graveyard from the battlefield, target opponent loses life equal to Marionette Master's power. So oh, that oh. was just three artifacts you just pitched into the graveyard. And you can do it over and over again. And <laughs> whoops, is that a Gatling gun I just built? Oh, Shivam. And then if you have uh, the master's best friend, the renegade firewalker, who says uh, whenever an artifact enters the battlefield, it does one damage to each opponent. And it's a lovely picture of me with a flame torch. Uh, by the way, if you totally look at that reckless fire weaver, it is like exactly like me when I was in college. Basically the best. So, uh, <laughs> you can just obliterate people really quickly. Uh, it seems like a good idea. You know, maybe I. You wore a blue scarf and ornate. I I have definitely uh, done so. Like at my uh, yes. at my wedding, one of the uh, items I wore was definitely a shiny blue scarf. Um, maybe I'll send you that picture. It's a really cool one. Um, yeah. But like his hairdo and glasses are totally me. But the other thing was. I mean, you can do all these cool things. One of the things I wanted to do was, like, one of my favorite infinite combos from when I first started playing Magic in, like, 1994 or 5 or whatever. Uh, we were playing a 12-person multiplayer game in the hall in front of math class after school one day. And we were, because, you know, 12-way multiplayer games are super great when everybody's playing grody, really grindy, slow decks. And one of my friends, who was actually a tournament player at the time, when the rest of us were not any idea what tournaments were, he pulled out this combo of cards that we'd never seen before. The great card Enduring Renewal, which is uh, an enchantment from Ice Age, <laughs> which shows your hand to everybody. 
And then if you draw a card, you reveal the top card of your library. And if it's a creature, you go to the graveyard. Otherwise, you draw a card. And you're like, why would you ever play a card that makes you throw things away? Well, the second clause is when a creature goes from the graveyard from play, return it to your hand. And there was this creature that came out in antiquities called Ornithopter, <laughs> which is the greatest creature <laughs> of all time. You know, zero, two for two, I mean, for zero. And everybody's like, why would you play a zero, two for zero? It does nothing. And you're like, aha. But if I toss it. I'll show you, kids. If I toss it into the altar <laughs> and get two mana and then fireball the entire table for 400 a person. Well, I guess I still just won in a turn, didn't I? Take that, whippersnappers. <laughs> yes, and it's, it's like the whole point of Commander is to be able to play combos that are the dumbest, stupid combos from your youth, right? Like, otherwise, why are we playing? We could just be playing standard, and we could be like, hey, win. It's like, win. Why do you want to win? <laughs> That's what we're here for. But you are winning with those infinite combos. This is true. I mean, the thing is, like, if you think about it, that's like six <laughs> cards out of the 99. The rest of them are all just dirtle thoughts. I, I love that you just say, this is true. <laughs> uh, you call a spade a spade. <laughs> but I mean, like, I wanted to put in the decoction module panharmonicon Verler, Verler virtuoso combo with Sahili yeah. Rai and be like, oh, I'm going to make infinite thopters with energy. And I really wish there was a good way to make energy work in commander i don't know if there is but i'm gonna try because why not i saw someone on morrow's blog say that uh they, they make an awful lot of energy in commander i would love to know how that person did that because i want to do that i think that'd be hella cool i mean energy is one of my favorite mechanics and i'm super bummed that we didn't get an energy matters uh commander you know, wouldn't that have been... Uh, a legendary creature that's uh, energy matter? Yes, I'm sorry, that's what I mean. Yeah. I don't say legends anymore, I just say commanders. Like, Hope of Girapur, <laughs> it's a commander for two. You know, a 1-1 one, one for one, whatever. <laughs> sure it is. Come on, dude, you know you want to make, like... Okay, the thing about the Hope of Girapur, which is, like, one of the neatest, flavorfulest cards they've ever come up with... Yeah, it really is. It's basically... If you've ever played the old video game Star Control 2... Uh, it's basically your mothership at the very end of the game loaded up with bombs to go and blow up the bad guy. And it's like the coolest thing ever. It's a disrupting missile. I love that thing. And then you can recur it a million different ways from your graveyard and just keep... And those bombs are planeswalker shaped. Yes. So good. <laughs> I haven't read it yet. <laughs> oh, man. Dude. Yeah, today's story is pretty good. Not going to lie. Yeah. Um, all right. All right. All right. We will read it right after this. Yeah, cool. Um, but yeah, there's also cards like War of Invention, you know, the the new tutor that just came out. Because if you're going to have all these Thopter and Servos, you might as well use them to get, I don't know, uh, Torrential Gear Hulks out of your library and put them into play. Yeah, anyways, uh, what do you guys think? What should I put well, in Well, you have War of Invention. What about uh, Mechanized Production so that you can win with infinite Thopters? Oh, yeah. I haven't gotten that card yet. I should... Uh, Basically, so far, I've just been taking the cards from Aether Revolt that I opened up in my pre-releases and putting them oh, in yeah. here. So I was going to put, like, you know, uh, Baral and Sram, and I guess those are the only two I got out of that. Is that how you pronounce his name? Okay, so here's the thing. Let's pause and talk about those names for a second. So, uh, Kari Zev, that's yeah. at least pseudo-legitimate. Right, like Kari is a real name. Uh, Zev is like they don't really have a Z sound in Indian languages. They come from Urdu. You're borrowed, but whatever, it's fine. Raghavan though is her monkey is a real name. Like that, hella Southy name. That's super cool. Uh, Yeheni, <laughs> well, Aether Mortar made up. Yeheni is made up. That's fine. Um, Baral is also a fake name, but it fits the linguistics. Sram. SRAM, though, is... <sighs> SRAM is, like, the Cambodian take on Hinduism. You get, like, the Shah sound becomes a Sa. You get... There's a lot of, like, linguistic morphing going on. But when you read the articles, you realize that they call them SRAM because it's supposed to be SRAM because it's, like, the technical uh, term for 
you know, random access memory. Static, ran, and static it's like, rank. oh, really? Yeah. Well, I guess you could fake it into India. That I mean, that's fine. He's a cool character, whatever. But people are always like, how do you press RAM? And all like, beats the hell out of me, man. It's not a real word. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, that's the thing, though. Like, call it Ash. I was hoping there would be more real words, but having now sat through a full season of watching streams, I understand why there aren't. It makes a lot of sense. Like, Aradara Express. Okay, that's easy. Cumble. Cumble Council of Allocation, I've heard say a million different ways. Cumball, Campbell, Campbell Soup. But no, it's Gumble. It's the two A's are like, oh. Yeah. And then like, you know, Narnum Cobra. The, the problem is when they're writing these names out, they don't double the A's where you would have a long vowel. They just write them the way they would be in English. So you're kind of expected to just know how Hindi phonetics works to know that like the two A's in Narnum are different. But like Ovia Pashiri, you know, that's at least easy. Prakta Club Security, that one's hard for me to say, little and hard for you guys to say. The Dukara Scavengers. and The one that kills me, though, is Rushmi. Rushmi, Eternity's Crafter, gets called Rashmi all the time. Rashmi. And I'm like, guys, that one's actually a real name. Like, I have mm. people in my family named Rushmi. And Wiley Bandar. No, it's Bandar. But nobody's ever going to be able to say Bandar. It, it rhymes with under. But it's like Bandar. Now, one of the cool things, though, is like there was a card, Dipala, the pilot exemplar dwarf pilot. She's super cool. And I won a gigantic version of her from PAX. So in my house right now, I've got like this three foot by two foot version, basically a life size dwarf pilot exemplar hanging <laughs> on my wall. It's pretty neat. Did you frame it? Uh, no, because it's like made out of like a uh, foam board, it's hard to frame. But it's cool. It's just hanging So you're there. going to get 14 more of them and carve out a 3D version? I would love to do that. <laughs> Holy crap. And then slam that down on the table. <laughs> you could use it as a table. <laughs> 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 this set is so cool and also just so stomach wrenching. It, it seriously like gives me whiplash every time I think about it. Like the art yeah. on these cards is so amazing sometimes. And sometimes it is so not amazing. I'm sure you saw the uh, consular, I don't know what the hell, Dreadnought, the the 7-Eleven. Uh, yep. I'm not sure if you're familiar with 7-Elevens uh, or who owns them, but by and large, most of the convenience stores in America are owned by South Asian people, and one of the most common stereotypes in South Asian culture is, thank you, come again, with the Apu accent. You know, Apu Nahasavita Fetamalan or whatever from The Simpsons, as voiced by a white guy pretending to be my uncle. Um, and so it, I was just like, okay, 7 Eleven. Now, you had an interaction with Mark Rosewater about that, didn't you? <sighs> oh, did I? I mean, here's the thing I was willing to write it off as just like, oh, you know, Wizard R&D likes to have random numbers in their power and toughness. They like to use weird combinations they haven't used before. This is probably just a coincidence. And then in Morrow's, uh, you know, blog entry, he's like, yeah, dude, if I was in charge, I would have put a, like, you know, convenient somewhere in the name. And I'm like, oh, no, this was oh, not, in fact, God. just a coincidence. This was deliberate. Oh, no. Why would you do that in the Indian set? Like, literally the most commonly insulting stereotype we have and everybody like people got so defensive they're like oh, dude it's just a convenience store we're only talking about the store and stuff how dare you tell them what jokes to make i'm like no you idiot you don't get it the store is a synecdoche for indian people when you say like convenience store you're thinking of the turban guy behind the counter you know it's like thank you come again here's your slurpee it's every joke i've lived with my whole life and i was like i thought we were in the clear and no <laughs> we're not <sighs> but mark apologized and he was very kind about it so uh i was like all right fine the next time we go to kaladesh let me know and i will help you so out. they use internal consultants for 
uh, yes. in order to design and develop Kaladesh. Right. right, but but here's the thing. So Kaladesh and Aether Revolt were done two years ago, and they were the first real sets that they used consultants on. So like when you look at like the description of how we got Kaya in uh, the um, conspiracy set, he goes into a super long, detailed conversation about how he worked with this black writer, and they came up with a lot of cultural things and did a lot of back and forth. That was using the lessons they learned from building Kaladesh, where they didn't do that. Right. Kaladesh, they did, what they did was they had like chunks of the set that they thought were questionable, and they had these people come in and say, oh, that looks cool. Oh, I want to show my kids that. Oh, you know, you shouldn't do that because of these reasons. But they didn't ask for ideas or feedback from that direction. You know, they were only like one-way transmission of, here are things, what is your thought? As opposed to, what are things from your culture that you think would be cool in this situation? And they didn't do that with all the cards. They only did it with some of the cards. And so you end up with things like innocuous things like, oh, it's just got a 7-Eleven. And people online and Twitter were like, dude, it's just 7-Eleven. But I was at pre-release and there were people who were totally doing the voice and, you know, saying open 24 hours and making all the jokes that are associated with 7-Elevens and Indian people. And I'm like, they all saw it. Why didn't you see it? Right. Right. Like, so you know how we have the oath cards, right? Like all the planeswalkers and the, the super friends have their little oath of Gideon, oath of whatever. And they're all doing kind of like the St. Hagiography. Oath of Jace is the most important one. Well, I like, I like, uh, Oath of uh, Nissa <laughs> and Oath of Gideon a lot because they make soldier tokens and stuff. But yeah, you know me and soldier tokens. Uh, mm-hmm. But the thing is, though, like those pictures are all very like standard Catholic looking. You know, a man is holding his hand up in a benefit, like benediction pose, like with a yeah, almost like an sword. inauguration. <laughs> you know, a religious <laughs> depiction. Let's say. Now, yeah. <laughs> when you are looking at uh, Aether Revolt, they have Ajani, the plant walker. A Johnny, the giant half man, half cat being, who looks exactly yeah. like the Hindu deity Narsima, uh, Vishnu, who is a half man, half cat. And there's a picture of the oath of Johnny, where his hand is up in the blessing. He's got the mace on his shoulder. He's got the crown, and he's literally the picture of Hanuman that you see in every Hindu household. And I'm like, guys, you said you weren't gonna do this. And some folks in Watsi got back to me. And they're like, we didn't even realized that that was going to be a thing we were just modeling all the other oaths it was going to be exactly the same and I'm like yeah that would be fine if you printed this in Ravnica or Innistrad where it doesn't matter but people forget that context matters and when you're in a set that's even as uh, thinly Indian as Kaladesh is even that the veneer itself is just Indian it's Indian enough that you should think about maybe not having angels maybe not having uh, animal-headed beings or blue-skinned people. Like, come on, dude. It's We're not asking a lot here. Uh, or maybe I am. Uh, anyways, Thopters. Thopters are totally... You know, weird. if Angel of Invention's uh, robe thing had been changed to a different color, it totally would have ruined the composition of that art. It's, it's not even the color. It's also the helmet and the swords and the skin tone and the fact that it's an angel. The unindigenous imported colonized like okay look they didn't do steampunk because they didn't want to have the victorian racism that goes along with steampunk they went with etherpunk but angels are literally christianity into hinduism come on come on <laughs> like that is like it's almost like they went and meticulously avoided anything that could be offensive in the entire set and then shoved it all into the angel well it's not like they have the angel you know ripping its chest open <laughs> Do well, they have, have um, what's his name, uh, Gunti's heart. Oh, well, that, that's fine, whatever. That card also oh, sucks. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, that was my second voice coming through. Oh, my. <laughs> what do you think of Gunti's heart, Nate? Uh, I gotta re- remember what it does. Uh, it gives you energy for something, and then you can sacrifice, you pay eight energy and exile it, and get an extra turn. Uh, eh. Yeah, energy. But- there's easier ways to get an extra turn. Yeah, and it exiles, so you can't even, like, do fun tricks. You can't abuse it, you mean. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Why lie? It's for the booze. <laughs> but, yeah, just quickly, I'm, like, looking through all these other cards here, and 
basically I pulled out all of the cards in Kaladesh and Origins that had to do with uh, uh, Thopters, and yeah, it's so it's so much fun. Like playing like you know Whirler Rogue with the tap two Thopters, and uh, your dude is unblockable, or all your artifact creatures get haste, or like Maverick uh, Thopterist who brings his buddies along. Um, Baral's expertise that lets you bounce their dudes and then play, I don't know, Brea for free. Um, and it's just, oh my god, I didn't even realize that. You could use Baral's expertise. If, if Brea's in your hand. But you could you can bounce her with the expertise back to your hand mm. and then cast the card. <laughs> mm. What? Oh man. Oh my. That could get dumb quickly. <clears throat> Yeah, and then like things like Quicksilver Spy that lets you tap one of your uh, random mono rocks to draw a card, or the other Quicksilver one that lets you ping people for two, mm-hmm. and then Padim who lets you uh, all your dudes become indestructible, and oh, I'm sorry, hexproof, not indestructible. Hexproof, yeah. I don't know. It just it seems like all of these fun artifact cards just synergize so perfectly in Brea, and because she's like every artifact color. That means that you don't have to make the hard cuts. You can do things like have all the that one white uh, path to exile if you've got metalcraft, or um, you know that's a great card. Uh, the battle at the bridge, the black card that lets you do uh, negative X, negative X, and gain X life with improvise from Intervolt, because mm-hmm. that's an awesome targeted removal yeah. spell. Um, I don't know. I just think this is going to be like the perfect mono Kaladesh set. I just wish she wasn't from Esper. Oh. <laughs> flavor fail. Why is it a flavor? Why, why is it a flavor fail? Because all the other cards are from Kaladesh, and she's from. Oh yes, right. Yeah. Um, but it's okay. She came over on the Planar Bridge. It's exactly, fine. exactly. The Planar Bridge actually, I think, serves as a nice vehicle for explaining Commander. Yes. Yes, it does. Yeah. Like we all have little Planar Bridges that we bring our armies through. Yep, and that's why you've got. The most bizarre bulk of random crap that just shows up. I don't know. I love Commander. I think it's super fun. But I'm one of those Vorthoses, so all of my stuff has to match, and it becomes really, really. Mm. Yeah, well, I don't know. <laughs> it really bothers you? Oh, man. It's like, it grates like just someone gently, gently rubbing their hands across the chalkboard. But, I mean, it's it's not even, like, it's not their mistake. It's not anything. It just, it could have been. It could have been, and it would have been amazing. But I guess it does make more sense for her to be Esper instead of Kaladeshi. But whatever, who cares? I get to have my Thopters, and I get to throw M&Ms at people. And really, that's all I can ask for. <laughs> Indeed. What more is there to ask for <laughs> than being able to throw M&Ms at your fellow players? Yeah. I just hope at GP I can get an... A masterpiece ornithopter because those things are gorgeous. Oh yeah! Like, I don't even. I mean, I shouldn't put it in my EDH deck. It's terrible objectively, but it's also one of my favorite cards of all time. And if I made a thopter deck and didn't have the thopter, I don't know that I would be able to live with myself. Yeah. Well, if you know, if you're going for the enduring renewal combo, yeah. I mean, I might not. Eh, that... No, I would put the. I, if you have an invention uh, ornithopter. And you probably should. I mean, they're only like 36 bucks or something. No, they were like way more than that when I was... Anyways, whatever. I will go Yeah, I'm going to look now, too. Ornithopter. Looking up. This will all be cut. <laughs> I didn't say ornery thopter. Uh, uh. Oh, he could be, you know, British and be the horny no. thopter. Just by saying ornithopter. Yeah, he just, you cut that. The ornithopter. <laughs> aye, aye, aye. Yeah, it's a... The, the Austin Powers uh, deck. Do I make you orny, Thopter? Do, do ornithopters... I can't even do it. <laughs> uh, do you think Sean will name one of his lizards Thopter? I hope Because so. if he's breeding them... You have to wonder, like, when your ornithopter breaks, do you have to go to the thoptometrist to get it fixed? Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh. You didn't warn Nate you were going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I amuse myself not Nate you're the punter yep <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what else should we put into Brea 
Any other suggestions, Nate? Uh, if you look at EDH Rec, the Brea page, they have a lot of data about Brea, but they don't have high synergy scores on pretty much anything here except for Paradox Engine. Paradox Engine has the highest synergy score, which means that out of all the decks that could use it, Brea's decks use it more, and if that's the case, then it has a high synergy score. Uh. But there's no signature cards section on this page, which means... There aren't any cards that break the 25% synergy threshold to even show up in that section. Hmm. It's probably too new. But one card I was thinking that uh, I haven't heard a lot of talk about that I think would be neat for this is the uh, Wrath Effect Hour of Reckoning from Yeah, Rathica. that's a good one. Uh, you know, it's four and three whites uh, with Convoke, which is destroy all non-token creatures. Yeah. And in a deck where you're going to have a ton of, you know, little trinkets being able to tap them all to cast a wrath of god that leaves all of your uh thopters alive seems a good idea right Mm-hmm. and i was thinking of like putting in like kathar's crusade because the fact that you get a ton of one one counters when you're just making the thop thop yeah it should be thop, in there thop, thop. <laughs> now the question i had for you guys as experts in this how many wraths would you put into a token deck? i actually so nate Nate will have a totally different... Uh, well, Nate, what? why don't you start? No, you start. All right. Since I started. Um, I have, by the way, Ornithopter is in the $40 range. Perfect. Among inventions, yeah. Um, I I have a dedicated token deck in Marath, and the, the strategy I use for Marath is that Marath is going to be the one with the most creatures on the board. And those creatures are typically going to be really big or causing a lot of damage um, when they enter the battlefield especially, right? Because uh, we're generating a lot of mana so that I can then beget more tokens using Marath. Um, not infinitely, but for very large values of mm. tokens. Um, so I actually don't run... I might run one uh, Wrath in there, and and that's only a might... Because I'm the problem that people have to uh. solve for, right? Like, my deck is the one that's going to have all the tokens that people need to wrath against. And so I don't want to be wrathing typically because I'm the guy right. with the most creatures or with the most effective creatures if I've got, like, you know, five or six super powerful Cathars Crusaded elementals. So if you're doing that with Brea, I don't know if I'd run a lot of wraths just because if you're going to have a lot of tokens, then let them solve mm. the problem. Good point, because I was also looking at Merciless Eviction, because, you know, it's got that kind of exile yeah. all artifacts or creatures or whatever or whatever, because it kind of would act yes. like a, a toolbox to solve, like, the specific problem. Like, maybe you're playing against a Super Friends deck and yeah. you just send them all into the grinder. Um, yeah, or you're playing an Enchantress, uh, an opponent oh, who's man. playing Oh, man, what was that deck, deck we played against when we played in GP uh, LA? The one where you basically flipped your deck over? Like the, you were playing like an enchantress or enchantment based deck off the the Theros god, the white white green one, I think. What? It was. I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, I don't know because I, I remember we played a game and you like <laughs> drew a million cards and just one card per trigger, trigger all the triggers, forever. trigger. Yeah, it was Karametra. That's my Karametra deck, but uh, oh my it's god, so it was the most obnoxious god. Yes, it was so obnoxious. <laughs> It's yeah. all the shuffling that makes it obnoxious. It really is. It's 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 almost too obnoxious <laughs> for me to play. You could skip the shuffling if you wanted. Well, yeah, it's you could, but so many of the creatures are enchantment creatures that they trigger both a card draw and a shuffle, right? And a and a hunt for a plains and forest. So, uh, in theory, I could stack it so that I look for the plains and forest. Uh, planes or forests afterward, but that's silly because you want fewer <laughs> lands in your deck, so you can cast more enchantments. Yeah. Oh boy! <laughs> so you're willing to be more annoying to the entire table for grinding out that one or two percentage <laughs> advantage. All you have to do is concede, and it's all over. Just concede. Or you could have that one card that does two damage to you every time you shuffle. Or you can just put a time limit on people's turns. I'm uncomfortable now, guys. Mm-hmm. 
hanger back walker. I don't know if you've heard about it, but um, <laughs> it also kind of makes thoppers, and uh, it does so when it dies. And uh, as it turns yeah. out, yeah, how about that? I don't know. I was thinking maybe it would be kind of neat to use in this, uh, especially with you know panharmonicons and what have. If you. you're recurring it back to your hand, that'll be pretty useful because it only gets thopter uh, thopters if it has a plus one plus right. one counters yeah. on it. It only gives thopters, yeah, you know, when it dies. But it still it seems like it would fit. And the will deck. the panharmonicon trigger on its death? I thought it was only. No, I don't think yeah. it does. Um, you know what does trigger though? Zulaport Cutthroat. Because when it dies, because like the thing I realized when I was building this deck is it's all about making a lot of thopters and throwing them away, and then just doing a ton of damage while they all <laughs> go away. So it's kind of like uh. I guess the sub theme of um, aristocrats, you know, where you're just like taking mm. your dudes and pitching them and just bing, 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 bing. What bing. about Vela the Nightclad? Oh, I haven't thought about that. That is an interesting idea. She's not a thopter. She likes thopters. That is probably why I didn't think about her. Look at her co- her cape cloak thing. It's uh, it's, like, it's almost like wings, and she's not Phyrexian. What does Vela do again? For you be uh, other creatures when, oh, ooh, that seems like it would be a yeah, good Yeah, and there are red enchantments that care when uh, when a creature dies, it does damage equal to its power. Uh, yeah. Are there? Wait, uh, I'm what? I'm trying to find it right now, but my computer is too slow. Or you could just put Perforos in there. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Perforos. Uh, see, that's the thing. Perforos breaks No, he's a god. Much. But he's, he's a god a... of the forge. Oh, he forges yeah. things. Oh, mechanical Daniel. things. Like thopters. But no, but I have a Perforos and he's in my soldier's deck and I don't want to take him out. <laughs> but uh, that's a good idea though because then... But Perforos is really obnoxious. So no. It, it's just like when, when somebody <laughs> plays a Perforos, you don't feel good. You're just like, that guy it means the game's going to gonna be over soon and you can play again. Yeah. <laughs> It's it's like the dude who plays sulfuric vortex in a commander in a um, conspiracy yeah. game. You're just like, ah, I guess I have to That's kill you. That's gonna first. end soon. It is certainly gonna end soon. <laughs> yeah, so I I don't know. That's kind of what I've got as a skeleton for this deck, including like you know, your standard draw cards and whatever. I don't know inspirations and opportunities and the one that's got Baral on it. Or Tezzeret, Tezzeret's Ambition? Yeah, that's one. it's a reprint, right? Like Thoughtcast. I thought Thoughtcast would be super cool because Affinity for Artifacts seems like it would work in this Yeah, direction. it does work. <laughs> You're going to have plenty of artifacts. I mean, when you cast Brea, you've got three right away. Um, exactly. And then you draw more yeah. cards. Oh, dude, Reclusive Artificer. That's the card I was thinking of. Uh, when it enters the battlefield, you can have it do damage to target creature equal to the number of artifacts you control. Ah, that seems like a good idea. <laughs> it's not a thopter, though. Nope. But it's from <laughs> Origins on Kaladesh, so that counts. Uh, let's see. Yeah, but like Jace's ingenuity. I don't know. I was thinking about Fumigate, but I don't think Fumigate fits this deck. No, uh, not really. Well, it. Ca- but like Sahili's artistry. Actually, Fumigate fun. does because you're killing all those gremlins. Oh yeah, because it's a thopter yeah. in the art. Duh. Oh, I do have a Stryonic Resonator. Look at that. That seems like it would be Do you have Pandemonium? When... Pandemonium? Isn't that the red enchantment that does chaotic yeah, well, things? Well, whenever a creature enters the battlefield, that creature's controller may have a deal damage equal to its power to target creature or player of his or her choice. Now, that's a double-edged sword, but... I do not mm-hmm. have that card. Let me see. That seems yeah. neat. What I do have, though, is Intangible Virtue, which is all the creature tokens you have get plus one, plus one, and Vigilance. Mm-hmm. And Era of Innovation, which is when your artifacts come into play, you get two energy, and then you can sack it to draw cards. I think that's how you get a ton of energy with this deck. Oh, man. I'm super excited. And then, like, you know, Gear Poor Aether Grid. Tap two on tap artifacts and ping somebody. Why not? <laughs> it's all the... Just... God, I'm so excited to play this deck. So now your wait. deck has 500 it's, cards in, that you have to cut down? It's literally... <laughs> It, it is an entire fat pack. It's actually just going to be, uh, yeah, this is, 
This is, I guess, my new Battle of Wits deck. Oh, really. <laughs> hey, listen to this. Now, it's it's Commander we're talking about, and so lots of people draw cards, right? Lots of big grips. Uh, Vicious Shadows, an enchantment. Now, it's a little expensive. Six and a red. Whenever a creature is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, you may have Vicious Shadows deal damage to target player equal to the number of cards in that player's hand. Oh, man. Take that, Josh Lee. <laughs> pow, pow. You and your 6,000 cards in your hand. I don't know. I think this there's a lot of interesting and fun, exciting things in here that we could be doing, and I'm super stoked to try yeah. this out. Well, uh, yeah. Nate, you will be slash have been at GP San Jose, so uh, hopefully you will be able to hear all about Shivam's deck playing and the uh, and the side events. Mm-hmm. Yes. Or actually, it's not even the side events. It's just sitting in the back corner playing Commander. While Basically. other people pay eighty bucks to lose games to Ephraim. Pretty much. Thanks for the table, Pretty wizards. Much. It's Channel Fireball, <laughs> technically. <gasps> That's why we should have paid the entrance fee, because you get the Channel Fireball sleeves too. Oh. Yeah. Yay. Um and the scork pad. And uh those cool tokens. Sounds swell. I don't know. Channel Fireball is a really cool store though, and it's Yeah, they super- actually are. Like, it's fun to, like, their actual store is down the street from my office, which is pretty neat. Uh, so I can go to the game center there and check it out. And it's, the caliber of player there is very good. They're much better than I am. But it's just cool to know that, like, it's right there and you can go see, like, all the super fancy players you read about just scrubbing and playing Magic all the time. Yeah. I don't know. It's neat. Uh, it means, though, that every other player in the Bay Area is also, like, Channel Fireball quality, so you just get your ass kicked a lot. Mm. Um, anyways, that was fun. <laughs> I like Brea. Yeah, Brea's really cool. And, I'm uh, I'm actually playing her in my league. Oh, that's cool. How's that going? Are you playing just as a pre-con? It's the pre-con, but we're doing a draft league. So every after every week, we tally up the scores, and based on the scores and who was eliminated first, we um, we draft cards. And the the we have a couple of rules. Basically, uh, uh, we can only draft cards that were printed uh, after or during the first Commander 2011 set, right? And uh, so any card printed after that, whether regardless of uh, what product it was printed in. That opens up a bunch of things. And, uh, of course, you cannot draft a card that already is in someone else's deck. Mm. Yeah. That's neat. That sounds like a lot of fun. It is. It is. Um, I've only managed to make it to two, and actually this weekend I'm going to miss the fourth game. So I'll have to come back for the fifth game. I'm I'm behind in my drafts, unfortunately. So, uh, But I did draft Cyclonic Rift first. Well, what do you think about the deck having now just played it straight out of the box? I love it. It's fun. It's it's it it feels like a Rube Goldberg machine. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Are there any cards in there that you think I should keep? Crickets. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh it does have the uh wellsprings and mm. they are clean of Phyrexian taint. <laughs> So you should use those. I was told that Kaladesh was going to get invaded by Phyrexians by a drunk developer at PAX, but it turned out to not happen. So huh. I'm just going to say he was trolling me. Yes. That could not possibly happen in the future. Mm. Yeah. Uh, worm Coil Engine. You need the invention for that, though. Yeah, no, I definitely want to put Worm Coil into there, and I want to get the invention, but we'll see how the how the show goes. Oh, you you have to get that invention. It looks hella cool. Doesn't it? I mean, Doesn't and it? plus, you know what <laughs> makes me sad, though? There's, like, no invention worm coil tokens. Like, why would you do that to me? Why would you make me use plebeian tokens when you, instead of, and you can't even use tokens because they're, like, what, the last Because com- they gave us a legendary monkey token. But they didn't give us invention worm coil tokens. How dare mm. they? I am willing to overlook that. Yeah, to be fair, though, the legendary monkey, pretty amazing. Kari yeah. Zev, not going to lie, is the coolest character in the set. The most Indian-looking character. She's got a real monkey that's really destroyed by house in India. I'm basically okay with this. I love everything about her. I was so excited. Yeah. 
and uh, her monkey's name is uh, Ragavan, right? Uh, sure, sure. <laughs> you know, it was Ragavan. Convenience stores. Ragavan. Hey. All is Ragavan. Badoom. All is sacrifice. I have to admit, I look at this worm coil engine art, and I, I'm looking at it right now, and I felt uh, my pulse increase, <laughs> and I grew a little flushed, and it's only about 60 bucks. I say only, which is an absurd amount of money to spend on a magic card. But it's a worm coil engine. But it's a worm it's coil I know. Yes. Oh, it's sparkly. It's clean. What could possibly go wrong? Dude, the thing is, though, like, when you look at the uh, Gear Hulks, the Masterpiece Gear Hulks look so cool. Yeah, they do. And they're all, like, coppery and beautiful. My only regret is that the Gear Hulks weren't given their Spanish names. Because uh, in Spanish... They're Mecha Titans. Not Gear Hulk, Mecha Titan. Oh, come on. And the 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 white Gear Hulk is Mecha Titan Cataclysmico. 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 How amazing of a name is that? Oh. Mecha Titan Cataclysmico. I wish they were all like that. Why I think did that's, Gear Hulk? I think been, that's the only way Nate is gonna refer to them from now on. Mecha Titan. That's amazing. It's so good. Combustible. Yeah. I don't know. I'm super excited. Torrentia. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that's cool. I am stoked. I think this set is super great. And um, I just like making a lot of tokens and thopters. And who doesn't? <laughs> Guys who play Fumigate. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, monsters yeah, you... too. People who play control decks. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Terrible monsters. Mm. Um, well, it is almost the end of the show, isn't it? Sure. It feels like we've been talking for days, <laughs> but not long enough. We could talk for hours more, but in the interests of uh, uh, getting some sleep tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is a rather late recording session, not going to lie. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I didn't expect us. I, 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 I'm looking at the time code now on the recording, and my, it ran away from us, didn't it? It always, I mean, what the last time I was on, it became a two-part, that could have been a three-part episode. Yes, it could have been. <laughs> it could have been. Um, well, it is almost the end of the show, then. Let's, let's, uh, <laughs> let's acknowledge that. Kind of accept it uh, and and understand that Nate has a message for us. Mm-hmm. So there's this card from Visions. It's called Corrosion. It's an enchantment for one mm. black red. It's got a cumulative upkeep of one. So at the beginning of your upkeep, you put an age counter on the permanent, and then you got to sacrifice it unless you pay oh. the upkeep cost for each age counter on it. At the beginning of your upkeep, Put a rust counter on each artifact target opponent controls. Then destroy each artifact with converted mana cost less than or equal to the number of rust what counters the on hell? it. <laughs> now, if it matters, artifacts destroyed this way can't be regenerated. Uh, not that that's going to come up. And when corrosion what? leaves the battlefield, remove all rust counters from all permanents. But hey, if I get a next turn and this is still there, hey, Shivam, all those thopters, all those servos, all your clues. Hey, take that soul ring, throw it in the garbage. Take your expedition map, garbage. <laughs> take your skull clamp, throw it away, all gone. And then if I got mana next turn, I'll do it again. And the next oh turn, God. and the next this turn, the and the machine. next turn. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of ruins the day, doesn't it? You can go to hell and die. <laughs> wow. That is wow. a friggin' mean card. That is not nice at all. I just got to yeah. have the mana and uh, get to have a next turn. <laughs> well. And you'll have at least three mana, won't you? Mm. This is hateful. Turns out disenchant is a white creature, uh, is, a, is a white spell, and yeah. Brea has planes. So, we're going to have to keep that in mind. But it's not a Thopter, so let's see if it makes it through that 500-card winnowing process. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, this this is in fact true. I'm gonna show up with like 99 lands and a PNLR, and that's gonna be my deck. But you do have to use a beta disenchant if you use it, because it shows that artifact being broken. Yes, yes, I do. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, I'm I'm super excited to play with Pia and Pia and Kieran and Chandra. Yeah, and, you, and you get friends. all of them. The whole family. Which Chandra? Um, the the current one I have is um, the one that has four abilities on her from Kaladesh. Uh, was it? I don't even know what it's called. The one that lets you for the plus one get two red mana or flip the top card and do damage. Um, yeah, isn't it Fire of Kaladesh? I don't. I genuinely don't remember. It's some, it's something like that, or like the torture. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Torch of it, Defiance. There that's you go. Weird. Is that the smiling one that came in the Planeswalker decks? God, I hate that art so much. Okay, so that is like the ugliest card in the entire set. One of the ugliest cards in the entire set. Um, but the weird thing is, it's by my favorite magic artist, which just makes me so salty. Because <laughs> he's the guy who did the Chandra from uh, Oath of the Gatewatch, which is the coolest looking. And I'm like, how did you miss so badly? How did you miss so well, badly? He had to paint a smile on her face. Yes, this is true. <laughs> Chandra's smiling? What? <sighs> all of those all of those planeswalkers, I call them the smiling planeswalkers. Because even Tezzeret is like, mm, hey everybody. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I need to get a black and the, the black and blue Tezzeret. I've got the mono blue Tezzeret. I think he'll go into this deck. But the black and blue one I think would be cool. Uh from Meriden Besiege or whatever it was. The agent of Bolas? Yes. But maybe that's not flavorful. Oh well, I don't have him anyways. It doesn't matter. Oh, it's flavorful. It's a cool card. I like that card a lot. He's from Esper as well. He's got a robot arm. He's got a robot arm. Brea has a robot arm and intestinal tract. Brea <laughs> is, uh, is holding together yeah. somehow. She's got a robot skull, doesn't she? And a little robot Two? hat. Yeah. A cutie little robot hat. I don't know. She's like, I was totally going to make a partner deck with... Uh, the merfolk guy because I wanted to build my Kiora deck but I saw Brea and I was like oh my god I can make the Thopter deck in my dreams so that's what we're gonna do Thopters yep. all the time yep that's what you do you have Thopter Foundry in there of course I do yeah and Foundry of the consoles very and good Whirler Maker and uh, all of the things that make little things that go thup 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 <laughs> And uh, I believe that's actually required. You have to go thop, 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 thop every time you play a Thopter. Yeah. Master Trinketeer, of course, the Thopter Lord. Mm-hmm. What, how many, what's the card count now, Nate? Uh, 520. <laughs> <laughs> Look, man, I like cards, okay? So we'll post a final deck list when this episode goes up, and uh, we'll see what she yeah. whittled it down to. Yeah. Yeah, it should be exciting. I look forward to hearing what the the listeners have to say. Well, Shivam, how can people reach you? Uh well, uh generally I'm on Twitter at uh Electrotal, E L E K T R O T A L. But right now if you were to go to my Twitter feed, it would generally be a lot of existential panic about the current state of affairs. Hmm. So if you want my thoughts on magic, I recommend you go to my secondary Twitter, Girapuri Gears, uh, which is G H, uh, I don't know, however you spell Girapur. G H I R A P U R I G E A R S. Yeah. Yeah. Girapur and then you, Gears. You have a Tumblr as well, don't uh, you? Yeah, my Tumblr is Talanthas, uh, T A L I N T H A S. Um, Who, of course, is a. Uh, my uh, old Dragonlance for... character. Yes. <laughs> Not going to lie. I, look, dude, yeah. I've been a nerd a long time, okay? Knight of Salam. Uh, no, this is actually my um, my half elf character from way the fuck back when. Um, whoops, <laughs> I totally went the entire the entire time without swearing. Well, mm. until now. Uh, there was some <laughs> religious swearing in there. Um. Hmm. Okay. Well, y'all y'all can figure that out in in post. <laughs> 
All right. Awesome. Thank you for hanging out with us. This Absolutely. Was a lot of fun. I love this podcast and I'm really grateful for the chance to come back. Um, I'm also really grateful to the listeners for the wonderful comments that I got the first time I was here. Uh, I was just amazed and overjoyed at how uh, kind everyone was, especially given how sensitive of a topic it is. And um, it gives me heart that the magic community has potential to be a really good place and a really accepting place and a really understanding place. So, uh, yeah, I was more than happy to come back on and uh, I'm always happy to join y'all. Cool. Well, you're always welcome. Always welcome. I mean, you, you always need a shot of them, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we will get to an uh, uh, a Sean Watson update. Uh, kind of, uh, we'll, this this will be our teaser for that at the end of the show, and we'll talk about that. And then, of course, Shivam, you will take us out of the show. So, um, everybody, everybody listening, still, thank you for hanging out with us. This was awesome. We love having Shivam on the show, and we love you folks. And if you want to support the podcast for all the good Shivam stuff we put in your ears, <laughs> oh, uh, sorry, I don't, I don't know. I don't think uh, my wife would approve. Yeah, let's let's not tell her. Um, head on over to patreon.com slash commander and give us a buck a show. It's, like I said earlier, it's easier than ever uh, with a special buck a show pledged here. And uh, people are taking advantage of it. So it's good to see that. Thank you very much. If you donate $10 or more per episode, you can come join the patron chat community we host over on Facebook. Ordinarily, our $10 patrons in that chat group they will uh, contribute a lot of questions. Anybody who listened to the last couple of episodes with um, Ben Hayes and your friend Sean Main, he was just on the show. Yeah, I um, love those two episodes, by the way. the uh, Sean, like, I love listening to Sean talk. I think he's my favorite magic designer. He makes my favorite magic sets. So uh, it was super cool to have, for you guys to have him on again. And uh, I really enjoyed that. Yeah, he, he is a wonderful guest. And we get to talk about... All sorts of design topics that we just don't get, otherwise get to hear about. It was wonderful. Yeah, I know. Totally it was really out. enlightening. Yeah. Um, and uh, so our patrons in the chat group actually helped us with uh, questions for that one and, of course, the Ben Hayes episode. Um, or, of course, you know, just head on over to iTunes, give us a five-star review. That's fine, too. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Screw we, Leovold. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Indeed. Um, so we are incredibly grateful to all of our patrons. So, so come on down and get your gratitude, just like Cole Van Cedars and Kevin Farr and Logan Ferre 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 are getting. <laughs> Got to finish that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my favorite part of listening to the show, Nate, is when. You make a comment, and you, you like you have to make the comment faster than you can get the microphone to you, <laughs> mm. and uh, it 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 wreaks havoc with the levels. But you know, it's just so much funny to hear something happening like that, <laughs> um, and your your laughter in the in the background is funny. Uh, I dig it. Whoa, so I have to... Exactly, you did that with Ben Hayes a couple of times. <laughs> uh, hey, Shivam. Yes, sir. I'm going to give you three guesses as to who created the theme song for the podcast. The Lizards. <laughs> A very close friend of the Lizards, Mr. Nate Burgess. What? I stole two of your guesses. Yes, he created it. Commander. Yeah. I love that theme song. <laughs> love it. It's inspired. Um, Nate, do you play banjo? Mm, no. Oh. I probably no. could if I took a while. Well, you got a four months or so. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, our logo was created for the podcast by Mr. Picto, who could be found at mrpicto.co.uk with help from Kelly DeLuca. Terry Robertson probably handled the editing for this show. Hey, Terry. Oh, yeah. I know, right? He's got to deal with all of this. Uh, and
And special thanks to Hunter Pruitt and, of course, now Bradford Heron for putting the YouTube video together. And special thanks to the tech whizzes, Jesse Thompson and Graham Frank, for all of their assistance along the way. And, of course, to Justin for his server space. You can reach us by going to our website, commanderandmtg.com. <laughs> Nate, where on the social medias can they find us? Oh, a lot of places by putting Commander and MTG podcast in the search bar and hitting enter, mm -hmm. clicking the button, send that HTTP request to Google and it'll tell you where we are. Yep. And uh, individually on, on Twitter, I'm at KetJack. I'm at Mr. Plorg. And uh, of course, we've already discussed where Shivam can be found. And Sean, who is at Copain26, all questions about the lizard farming should be directed there. Nate, do we have an update? Like, can we uh, get a, a, a peek into the webcam that's constantly observing Sean 24-7? Uh, yeah, they have trained for their mission, and they are ready for go. Mm-hmm. Very good. I'm all excited. I can't wait to hear what this is. And, uh... Oh, you'll find out. Uh-oh. You'll find out. <laughs> I don't know why that broke me, but it did. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. All right. Shivam, it is time to take us out. Thop, 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 That was me flying away on my thopter. <laughs> the hope of lizard boar. Oh, <laughs> Peace out, kids. <laughs> Don't stay up so late. Commander oh,